Uh, the hashtag is uh, PyCon HK and PyCon HK 2020. And I, uh, we would like to thank our sponsor, Kofa Health, Microsoft, and MySQL. And most of thanks for our uh, 16 uh, speakers in this conference. They're coming from uh, Hong Kong and also uh, other country uh, in um, in Europe, in a in APEC, and also in uh, in America as well. And we would like to thank our volunteers teams. So they are help helping us to uh, do the uh, like uh, design and finance and also the uh, marketing as well and social network. And also thanks for our proposals wedding committee, Gavin, Scotty, and, and Yang and Kim. And, and here are some notes to everyone. Please mute your, mic, um, your microphone unless uh, you ask questions at Q&A. And please obey the uh, PyCon uh, code of conduct. And um, after the uh, and after this conference, please also uh, complete the uh, po uh, uh, post conference uh, feedback form as well. So you uh, you will uh, you can help us to improve our conference uh, next year. So you can scan the QR code and uh, uh, or also uh, use the uh, uh, link uh, bit.ly PyCon HK 20 feedback. Um here is another one of promotions again. So if you would like to uh, per, uh, purchase additional uh, T-shirt, it's just uh, Hong Kong dollars 100. And uh, uh, you can email to uh, PyCon at PyCon HK for the uh, details. And uh, uh, the list sessions is our, uh, is our kilo sessions uh, of the uh, English uh, com committee uh, chat, which is highly recommended by our proposal sweating team. The topic is uh, live.pycon.ny. What I have learned in building a production website that serves PyCon APAC 2020 within four days. So it's an uh, amazing uh, experience from, the, uh, from our fans uh, in Malaysia. So uh, our speaker is uh, uh, James, James Tan. So I so I stop the uh, show my 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 screen showing and um, and okay, uh, James, you can share your your screen now. Um, 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 please unmute your mic as well, James. Yeah, uh, yes, I have an issue right now. Uh, host disable participants screen sharing, so you might need to enable oh, my, uh, okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got oh, uh, Okay, you can try again. Great, okay. Okay, morning, uh, PyCon Hong Kong. This is James. Uh, you can also call me Ingwei. I'm from Malaysia. Pleasure to be here again. This morning, uh, my topic will be on uh, our work from PyCon MY who hosted PyCon APAC 2020 recently uh, in se September. So the topic will be just on focus on live.pycon.my and subtitles will be what I have learned in building a production web server that serves PyCon APAC 2020 within four days. Now, four days probably will be exaggerated, but the discussion wise has been taken a, a little bit on how we want to build it, but uh, due to some reasons in the operations, then therefore we have no choice but to build it within four days. Now, just a report to the website that what we have is, it is still alive. If you have happens to be at PyCon, dot my uh, no live dot pycon dot my you find it still alive which is something that we are very happy about because it, uh, if you build a website that normal uh, that use about the time of four days normally things are quite cranky in a way that it might break any time of it 
And to some extent, we feel very lucky that it hasn't, it's still alive till now. It has been running more than two months, has not been stopped. And of course, one thing that when we check the log from the web server, we find that a lot of people are doing a lot of scanning, vulnerabilities scanning, uh, malicious scanning. And we find that the website is still good for that and it's safe. Now, a little bit about myself, as I mentioned, I'm from Malaysia, and this is also the second time I speak in PyCon Hong Kong. So it's a great honor to be back again to speak at PyCon Hong Kong again. I'm being with PyCon MY's community for several years, and this is, I think it's my fourth year serving PyCon MY again. As a daily job for myself, I'm a senior automation engineer in one of the insurance company. So uh, the main task of my daily job would be handling all the network exceptions as well as taking care of the inventories for the network devices. Also, I'm, also, uh, I'm a self-initiate projects maintainer, meaning that I have several projects in GitHub as well. So do check out my GitHub if you feel like you, you want to uh, participate in some of my projects on that. Now, of course, we'd like to talk about a little bit about PyCon APAC 2020 this year. PyCon APAC 2020 this year is very interesting conference because it's a fully online conference. And it is something that we have never done it before. And the reason for that is because of the pandemic COVID-19 that's spreading around the world and forcing us that. If COVID-19 hasn't been there, PyCon APAC 2020 will be hosted in a very beautiful place called Kotakinabalu, Sabah which is on the East Malaysia. However, things have happened, so no choice. We have to shift that to uh, online conference. And this PyCon APAC 2020 consists of two weekends. And for those who have been there, okay, so it will be uh, on the 20, 20 to 13 September 2020, as well as 19 to 20 September 2020. We have about 180 participants over there, and the event itself consists of several talks, as well as the interviews with the key, uh, key uh, members and the prominent members from the community, as well as the panel session together with the tutorial. And not to mention that Sammy was one of the invited panelists from Hong Kong, and it is also uh, our honor to have him to speak in one of the panel session. Now, perhaps you might want to ask about this, uh, what is this talk about? when we put just a live.pycon.mic. Now, this talk itself is a sharing session. It's not going to contain a lot of uh, technical details behind what how we have built that, but rather we want to focus on one thing, how we actually learn from the failure. Because we all know that running a PyCon, it is not as easy as what we think. There's a lot of things that happens all the time. It can be some of the members leaving the community. It can be suddenly we have new members joining us. It can be a situation that we might have a financial problems or even operations problem. So I hope that using this talk itself, it will help us. It can help other communities by sharing our failures or also by sharing our uh, experience that we have faced during the, the uh, uh, organi uh, organizing PyCon so that other communities can benefit from that. So this is why this talk will be about sharing, okay? And I hope I do really hope that this can benefit other communities as well who is having the same problem as us. Now, perhaps you might want ask, what is the function of live.pycon.my? So live.pycon.my, it is not just about the live stream that you see for those who have joined. So it is also actually a pilot project that we want to use to build for the for the next generation of the uh, pycon.my's uh, web page on that. So first thing, we'd like to try it out whether we can build a portal that is exclusively for the app participants. Meaning that right now, we want to use that as a web app or the web portal that contains all the necessary information for the attendees. So such that uh, calendars, event notifications, or perhaps the streaming and everything. So this is actually is our experimental live project. But since due to the uh, COVID-19, so it turned out to be one of a good project and exercise for us to know how we can stretch our skills in terms of building something that useful, not just for the PyCon APAC 2020, but it also for something that for us to, uh, to the future. Because to our uh, anticipation, we find that COVID-19 will not be going uh, 
too uh, not be away too soon. So it will be there for a while. So therefore, this has needs to be something that will be there. So this is why. So again, back to the question over that. If this is a case of the life dot pycon dot mine, so what? Why do we actually need that during that time? So reason, as I mentioned before, re reason for us to need that because we want to keep the exclusiveness of the uh, content during the event. So this is why it turned out to be having a web app or web portal is very important because we want that we want to let the attendants know that they are uh, they are exclusive and they are important to us and they have their own ways to customize whatever contents that they want during the event. That's the first thing that we like to do. At the same time, we also want to think of a way to broadcast the event in live because right now the way that we broadcast the events is we either will go to the web, the Facebook or the YouTube or maybe Zoom or other means of the uh, streaming uh, platform. So we might want to think of a way to put it as so that live.pycon.my turn out to be just a solely event streaming during the PyCon event. But of course, as I mentioned before, what we also want to build for that is also a personal personalized uh, experience as well as a personalized service that uh, attendees have during the uh, event itself. So what do we actually have inside PyCon? live.pycon.my. So first we'd like to talk about a little bit about the architecture today. So the architecture wise is very simple. So it consists of one compute engine hosted in GCP. Okay, and it runs by few web application. Of course, right now turn out to be a flask, but we have few web applications running at the back end from the uh, compute engine. And this flask compute engine over there will talk to the another compute engine actually. It, it shouldn't be a cloud uh, uh, SQL, but uh, I'll just use this uh, symbol so that it can be explained easily. So this cloud SQL over there will be just another compute engine that has my SQL on top of it. So that it will be that. So this is something that uh, one of my uh, friends as well as the company that engage that we engage uh, recommend to us so that you mentioned that we segregate the web server and the SQL server separately so that uh, it won't interfere with each other. So this is how we have it for that. Now, of course, uh, for the web app itself, there's one reason that we choose Flask over Django. So initially what I'm thinking actually is for, we want to start with Django. Okay, and this is also my personal interest in that because uh, Django has always turned out to be a very interesting things to me, but I haven't, I have never have encountered any uh, experience or anything that I can have opportunity to learn Django. So I would like to take this opportunity to learn Django. Okay, but turn out to be within four days is quite a high learning curve for me because they have different kinds of component and for all different kinds of component or uh, it takes time for me to learn and not to mention that one big hurdles over there for me to stop myself uh, eventually using Django is well we have the front end build but I do not know how to connect the uh, front end view with the Django controller so that posts a question that I have down there which is can can Django actually helps me to build the web page in four days so after having this question popping around in my head, I decided to shift to something that I'm very familiar with, which is Flask. Because I've been using Flask for years to build a very simple application for myself in my own project. And I can easily build any web endpoint as well as the red endpoint in a very short time. Now, also looking at it, since we have the front end uh, been written by the uh, previous web uh, team, so what I need to do right now, I just need to integrate the web uh, front end with Flask easily without any problems. So I decided to use Flask and then I, of course, I feel that I'm confident to finish everything within two days and then sign up for another UAT test within next two days. But of course, one thing, as we mentioned before, since we want to have an exclusiveness of the uh, experience for the attendees, we need one thing. <laughs> ticket validation, okay? So this is how we do the ticket validations. 
before COVID-19. And this was the photos that was taken in uh, PyCon MY 2019. Previously, what we have done is we have the ticket vendors and the attendees will come to the uh, ticket ven uh, vendors website, register themselves. And once they have registered themselves, they'll get a QR code or the uh, emails from the ticket vendor. At the event day, they'll come to the front uh, ticket, not ticket booth, sorry, come to the front booth, validate themselves through either by QR code or the emails that they have received from the ticket vendor. Our volunteers over there will then validate and check their info and sign them in. So this is what we have done previously over in uh, previously in uh, pre-COVID time. But sadly, we cannot do this anymore because of COVID-19 and we have to maintain a social distancing, not to mention that we can't have our event at the physical location. So it turned out to be, if we want to keep the exclusive of the attendees, we have to think of the way to uh, validate the ticket. At the same time, we also want to know that if somebody purchased a ticket, how, how, how likely that the person will turn out for the event. So this turned out to be uh, quite a good statistics for us to know whether and uh, those who have bought the ticket turns out at the event. Now also we'd like to use that ticket as uh, identification whenever the user signs into the web app. So due to that reason, we decided to come up with an idea that we would like to build a middleway be uh, between that. So the way that we build the middleway is very simple or rather you can say that it's a in a very foolish way. So what we have as a flow chart over here is we let the users uh, to input the username and password Oh, sorry, there's a mistake over there. Should be a username and password. Once the, once the uh, attendees have enter, enter the username and password, then the system will validate the tickets. The way that it validates the tickets is very simple. The script or the web app will send the username and password to the database. And from the database, so it will validate whether this attendees has purchased a ticket. If the attendees have purchased the, the ticket, then we'll let it go through our internal page of the live pi, live .pycon mine. If not, we'll redirect it to the PyCon APAC ticketing pages. So it's a fairly simple system over there. So I, I'm not too sure whether we have done it a smart or foolish way, but this is how we do it. And the code itself is a pretty si simple code over there. So we have a endpoint over there. And by, by means of uh, PRTX over there, it was the, the name of the ticketing uh, vendor. So once we have that, we send, we first we check the status of the ticket. If not, we'll, uh, we'll show the page of checking. Once the user check in to the page, and then he'll get into to the internal page. So this is a simple code that we have on the Flux application, as well as this is the handler for the ticketing from there. So it sounds complicated, but actually it just do a very simple things that I'm going to show in the demo later. But of course, one will ask a question over there. Can't you just get the API to do the job for you? Well, sadly, when we choose this uh, ticketing vendors, we have been using this for a while and we didn't really notice that there was a, such an issue until recently. Because previously what we have done is we have done a lot of the uh, physical conference and for physical conference, QR code and email not notification, it has not been a problem to us because what we need to do is we just scan the QR code or what we, we can uh, we can check from the emails, then we are good and we can let the attendees to attend. So since there's no API from that, then we have to do a lot of manual work over that. For example, when we want to update the attendees, we have no choice but to use the script to load the information of the attendees into the database. And because of the manual work over there, and due to the last minute purchase for the ticket, we have kind of missed the attendees during the conference day. And it caused us quite a lot of problems over there, especially with the help desk that we set, set up because uh, people keep complaining that they cannot log into the system, their names are not there. And when they register, they cannot go to the certain page. <coughs> so it caused quite a number of issues to us. So we, what we're going to do is probably we can think of changing the ticketing for that vendor so that it can support us with in terms of the 
the uh, <coughs> event. So for those who knows anything that uh, ticketing vendors that is good for uh, to, uh, good, you know, in terms of providing the APIs, you can lo let me know personally on this matter. Now, once we have the ticketing vendors sorted out and the flux as well, then here comes one very important thing when you try to put the uh, to put the application online or in production. Web server gateway interface, which is also known as the WSGI. Now, there's two types of the uh, WSGIs that we know. Of course, you know a uh, few more than that, but there's two that is very popular among in <coughs> sorry wsgs g unicorn as well as uwsgs now just to make this uh page clear and i i don't really want to engage with any uh argument with this because this is something just by our observation maybe there's something that we do not know so i had to make a disclaimer over that so for this two uh wsgi what we found that is very fast but some web page actually claims that WSGI has a shorter response time, mean that w, uh, U, uh, UWSGI actually works faster. But for us, there's no difference with that because we have at most 200 users per second because our word, we have about 180 uh, attendees at one time. So if we just, let's say we do a simple math on that, and most what we can have is we can have 200 users per second to I mean, the traffic will be just about 200 users per second for our web server. So it doesn't make really big difference whether we choose GUnicorn or UWSGI. Now also for the case on that is we also found out that uh, GUnicorns turn out to be easier to set up. So this is also another reason to why we choose GUnicorn over the UWSGI. However, we we do want to try out the UWSGI in the future if let's say we have more load from that because according to the reference that we have with that, it actually says that UWSGI actually can hold more load than the G Unicorn. So we don't know, but and our, uh, our load is very low. So therefore we might want to keep a try on that. But there's another main reasons that actually we choose G Unicorn over UWSGS. <laughs> And this is due to one thing that I'm going to talk about now, which is the multi-trading. Now for the service on the productions, we would not want to run it on the single thread, single thread compared to, uh, you know, because single thread generally restrict one-to-one -one communication and it is not a multi-users communications. So when we started this project we started to test this with single track and there's no problem with that even with the uh, g unicorn or with uh, uw uh, uwsgs there's no problem with that because it's very fairly simple process because i'm the only one testing this thing but when we push this to uat and have this multi-trader workers under the uh, unicorn or uwsgs there's a very interesting problems that we face and um, I believe that for, for some of you, probably you have experience or encounter this as well, is an error message that we call lost connection to MySQL server during query. And they, this happens to both uh, UWSGI and GUnicorn, okay? But this something that is not happening during my dev or single threaded UAT. So we know that it's an issue due to the multi-thread, but we do not know how to actually fix it or which part that has gone wrong, okay? So if things are going wrong due to the multi-traded and because the time is pressing, so how can we actually put the thing? So first thing, of course, by human natures, we're going to do a search on the Google. So when we search about Google, we have a, a lot of different kinds of sound. First thing somebody was uh, argue saying is that we need to add a more MySQL connections. Some say it's uh, because you have too many forkings over the workers. So that how, therefore you have to restrict or lessen the amount of workers. And some will just say, oh, okay, why don't we just try uh, G Unicorn because uh, UWSGI will cause this blah, 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 this kind of problem. So, okay, so we'll say since the time is pressing and we have less than six hours to the event. So if, G Unicorn is simple enough for us to use, then why don't we just give a try on G Unicorn? Because I mean, we don't really uh, 
there's not much of a difference whether it's 200 users between UWSGS or GUnicorn. So we just give a try. And of course, one thing that what we can do apart from reducing the workers is we add in a load balancer to reduce that because we don't want to have too many users uh, going to the one web app at the same time. So we decided to choose Nginx as our web server as well as the load balancer because as what we know, Nginx has been quite a good load balancer with that. So to reduce the amount of the load on the particular web app, what we have on our load balancer over there is we're using a less connected mechanism so that when there's one server is loaded with a maximum load or maximum uh, connections, then we can read this, we can distribute the connect incoming connections to another load, uh, the another service. So that's how we build, build it. And then we group them accordingly to different parts. Then we run the web server. So pretty much things are very simple on that. Once this is done, then we begin to do a UAT test. The UAT test only consists of three users. And because of the time, we, we pass it. And we didn't really test it in a very proper way. So we just make sure that it runs and it shows the page accordingly. And that's it. Now, of course, this web page is not complete when we did the uh, UAT because what we have at the UAT is we're using a self-signed certificate by using the open SSL. So when we push this to UAT uh, that time, it caused problems from that because you know, for any web browsers, if you have an open SSL self-signed certificates, you, you always have a warning message telling you that the page is not safe. And during that time, we are nearly about to push that to production simply because we don't have the, uh, and again, this is also due to one issue that we never thought about that. We don't have a CA certificate and it takes time for us to purchase for the, uh, the CA certificate. So during the time at very uh, desperate period, we actually decided to put a self-signed certificate online. But thanks to some helps that we have got it from very last minute. So we managed to point, uh, we managed to create a sub domain on our WordPress DNS that we use on the PyCon.my web page. And then we point our uh, web server to a new uh, page, which is live.pycon.my. So once we have it, we are very ha happy about that because we can use that to generate a security LS certificate using a support. Okay, everything is done. And the only time that we have is about minus 12 hours before the event. Now, to make sure that the web app runs accordingly, and we know that there's an issue due to to the workers. So I decided to take my role as assist admin as well as the help desk together with data entry. By means data entry over there is means by uh, enter the data accordingly to the, uh, to the database and as well as the troubleshooters. Now there's one issue that happens that we do not know why, because we have never seen that issues during the UAT. And not to mention that uh, previously what I mentioned, we have only three, three users. And of course the test itself wasn't very rigorous and we didn't find out that. And perhaps we kind of guess what is the issue behind, but just that we don't know how to fix that. Now, what is the issue behind it? During the productions, what I have, and I believe that some of the uh, attendees this morning who attended the uh, PyCon APAC, 2020, you might have this issue. You try to log in a few times with correct and username password and it keeps prompt, prompt with the wrong username password. But for some of the users who managed to log in successfully, it will, when you check into the page, you'll be redirected to the ticket page or simply it just says that you have not checked in. And the worst is we have few users couldn't log in at all to the page. Now, due to that, we actually received a very bad comment from one attendees through the Facebook chat. And then we got quite numbers of, uh, you know, nasty works that we have from the users. Now, of course, having all this setback from there and also all this issue does not stop us, but rather it forced us to reflect on how we can further improve. So as a matter of the reflection, what we have to admit that when we built this thing, 
uh, all of us are not really an expert on this matter. And certainly there's a lot of things that we have missed out. So if we are not an expert in this matter, we would like to find somebody that we can trust, that we can talk to so that we can share our issues or our problems openly. And once you share your problems openly, be prepared to take the critics in a positive manner and learn from the mistake. And often over time when we did the coding or the uh, applications, we have to admit that we like to do a lot of Googling. And when we search the solution from the Google, we tend to put it to our solution. But often over time, having Google over there doesn't mean that all the solutions that are found on Google is usable. Now, the last thing, the most important thing, and something that probably all of us has to keep in mind is that when there's a problem with the code base, please find the root cause and then fix that. So these are all the reflections that we have during on that. So we decided to go to the path of the code refactoring because obviously this is due to the issue with the coding. So I decided to, like I mentioned before, talk to someone that I trust. Kaki Sensei is the one that I trust because he has vast experience in building application and he knows how to do the troubleshooting effectively. So I decided to spend the night talking to him. So say, hi, hey bro, can we talk together? Can we have a deep dive on the application? Say, sure, why not? So we decided to spend about one and a half hour looking through all the application that we wrote, including from the database uh, uh, script, as well as the main web app to other uh, web page, everything that we have. And eventually after the one hours and 30 minutes troubleshooting, we found out with one issue, global singleton, okay? And you mentioned that, oh bro, you know that you have one thing, you have a, quite a bad practice in your code over there global singletons. So I didn't know that actually that caused the issues because actually when I wrote that application, I, I actually want to have something that is shortcut. And then I say, oh, okay, why don't we just put it in this way, which is global singletons. But we I didn't know that actually global singletons will cause that issue until we have the troubleshooting from that. The reason for uh, global singletons turn out to be one, a big issue from that is, Global singletons generally runs very well for single track and single workers because you know that is something that normally we write for the CRA based script or software or any you know proced procedurals uh, uh, code. But when it comes to all this multi trading uh, uh, environment, single uh, global singleton turns out to be quite a bad practice because when let's say you have a track A trying to send a message across to another end due, through the wet communications, due to the single uh, global singletons, it, when they have the different tracks, the tracks might not be able to identify dif different tracks accordingly. So this causes us an issue that we have when we deployed our web app on the multi-traded environment, which is, you know, on the different workers from that. So it turns out to be a very bad from that. So after the uh, troubleshootings, then Kaki Sensei actually mentioned one thing about uh, our web app. He says that, why don't you just write, you know, the con connection and considering close the connection after you have retrieved or write the data from or into the database, from the database after the application. So what I have is, okay, if this is the word from the Sensei, then I would like to try and write a new handler accordingly to do the operations for the crew, simple as that. So for each endpoint from there, or for rather for each app from there, if they will have their own connection that connects to the DB and deal with the crew operations. So sim as simple as that. So in the end, this is a simple code that I write for the registration page on that for the registration handlers. And what we have over there is for every time when the when the operate crew operations has completed, it will close the connection. And the issue just works. So finally, we have gets the uh, page to work and it works accordingly. And till now, it still works accordingly from that.
Okay, so that is the part for the alive.pycon.mine. But at the same time, we'll also like to share a little bit about what we have done over the streaming itself. Now, during the short time from that, we actually, I mean, prior before to live.pycon.mine, we actually tried out a lot of different kinds of streaming platforms. And again, we can't decide until quite a last, uh, one month about that, we decided to use StreamYard and YouTube. And probably you, you might say that uh, in the uh, say, well, in the beginning, you mentioned that you might want to stream with the uh, uh, the event on the live.pycon.my and why you suddenly switch to that. Now, there's one thing that we find out is the turn out to be quite a time consuming to build and as well as one thing that we might, uh, we have, uh, we kind of lack of knowledge on is the RTMP protocol for the streaming. So we have not had much knowledge on that. So this is why as a workaround, so we decided to have it on the stream yard as well as point the uh, streaming off from the stream yard to YouTube. At the same time, we, uh, when we deploy the stream yard plus YouTube, we, we find out it is also very difficult for us to, uh, stream that putting a page on the live.pycon.mine as well simply because uh, we as we mentioned before that we have the email address being populated manually into the database and it turns out to be it's also quite difficult for us to do it uh, to put the emails into the allowed list for the YouTube as well so frankly speaking it is very difficult for us to keep the exclusiveness of the event but even though it is very difficult, but we try our best to setting out a portal so that we know we keep the users to have some sort of exclusiveness so that they can retrieve the information from that. Now, of course, this also gives us a reflection that we might want to develop a players for the RTMP protocol in the future so that we can really you know, stream things, stream the events on the PyCon.my in the future. <laughs> So again, uh, just a summary for what we have done uh, throughout the, uh, you know, getting to know the different platforms that are used by various PyCon. So for PyCon uh, Hong Kong today, they're using the Zoom Live as well as the EuroPython. And for the recording plus YouTube, I get to know that PyCon Korea is using that and for as well as the PyCon US. Now for us, probably we might be the first one using the stream yet. PyCon APAC 2020 actually will be the, the one they use that. Maybe there are others PyCon that using the uh, uh, stream yet, but we do not know. So as part of a uh, conclusions, what we have now, these are actually the summaries that what we have learned by hosting PyCon APAC 2020. So, of course, undeniably, we, we cannot have the physical conference in 2020, but it doesn't mean that we are very far from each other, meaning, you know, we're still cl close to that. And one thing that we um, managed to do is we managed to get some of uh, community videos and showcase those community videos to, uh, during PyCon APAC 2020. And to me, having the community uh, video shows on PyCon APAC 2020 is a good approach because we can use that opportunity to introduce different PyCons around APAC. And of course, uh, using this opportunity, I would like to thank PyCon Hong Kong, PyCon uh, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan to send in the community videos from that. Now, apart from that, when we mentioned about this uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, COVID we also find that we have to have organization as well as the infrastructures uh, to be agile enough and flexible enough to adapt the change due to the pandemic because we, we do not know what's going to happen and things turn out to be quite sporadic and spontaneous. So we need to have an infrastructure that is really agile and so that we can adapt to the change. Of course, one thing that do not uh, shy to ask help uh, in the community. And also in this case, I would like to take the, the opportunity to thanks to EuroPython because EuroPython actually gave us a lot of ideas on host, how to host the online event. <laughs> Lastly, I would like to thanks uh, all these experts who has gave me a lot of ideas 
to build the websites and without them, it would not be able to build the web apps within four days. First, first uh, Qinghan, Qilong, Humi, Ivy, Jetro, Kage Sensei, Guan Li, and Pratipa. And thank you very much for helping me to build this website within four days. So our conclusion for that for the talk for this morning is we definitely want to deploy an automation for the next page because since COVID-19 is still there, it's not going to be away for, you know, for another few years. So automation turned out to be very important. And there's a few more automation that we can use in the future in, in terms of operational administrations, web app, as well as live stream. Okay, so if you are interested, you can join us for that and you can reach me with the email. Now, just a little bit of de uh, demo from there, I'd like to show on here. This is the page that have PyCon, live.pycon.my, as you can see. So if I enter the username and password, so get to the check-in place, and this is the middle way that we have developed. And click on that. You have check-in, and this is the page for the internal page for the livepycon.my. So fairly simple, but uh, this is what we have tried our best for the four days, and this is what we can do. Okay, so questions from the floor? Thanks, Jim. Uh, so I would like to uh, ask the participants uh, if you have any questions, you can type uh, on uh, uh, in the chat. And my and my show are questions from MJ. Uh, he say, uh, hi, yep. Jim. Can yep. you please explain a bit more about the problem with the global singleton? Was it because of the lock, locking waste condition with multi chain when initially the, the singletons, or was it because multiple archives was uh, were selling one collection to the DB? Yeah. Okay. Good questions. Okay. Now for this global singletons itself is more to a. Uh, uh, okay, it's more down, not really down to the uh, uh, race condition itself. Partly is because when we have the tracks over there, let's say imagine that right now you have, perhaps I use the word session will be easier. Okay, so let's say when you have the page over there and you're trying to click in one thing, when you send the information across. Okay, so when you send the session to the, uh, to the DB, Okay, to the DB object over there, they have a session record. But once they change the section, no, one, uh, okay, let me just think of a better way to do this. Okay, when the DB started, they actually have one session on that. Okay, that's one thing. So when you send the information from browsers with another different section and send to the DB, the DB actually got confused with the session because it's a single singleton. Uh, global singleton. So when you have a, a global singleton, actually all the different tracks that you have actually will have content with the same object. So it's not really about the uh, race condition over there. It's about the section has been different. So for example, let's say there's a very simple idea that I explained to that. So let's say in this case, when when you change the password on the DB, so you send in a write to the DB. However, due to this global singleton, it might not be able to pick up the change on the DB. So it still keep an old session. It has not been updated with the latest change the password. So once you change the password and you get back to logging with the username and password that you have over there, the new one, turn out to be when DB has not been updated, it still give you the old username, uh, the password. So this is why causing you unable to, you know, to change the username and password from that. So it is in this case, uh, I will say it's more to a session between the browser and the DB. So global singleton turns out to be not a quite good one when you have a multi a multi-thread multi because you might have a multiple sessions running at the same time. So when you, let's say user S wants to change the password, he might be uh, in some way he sends the thread to send the session from A to B. So it got confused, uh, the, uh, the DB got confused and then it might throw out something that is, you know, undesirable for maybe for other tracks as well. So it's not really a race condition, but rather it's more a session confused between browser and the database. Yeah, I hope you, I answer your questions. Thanks, Jane. So the last question from the audience, uh, from a Scotty God. Yeah, cool. So he, he asked, about, uh, do you have any difficulty in reproducing the 
the multi-thread problem, did you use any tools to simulate a uh, high traffic? Uh, no, actually no, because uh, one thing that we have over there is we assume that we have only about 200 users on that. So unless we have a load of maybe getting, let's say 10,000 users per second, then of course, uh, one tools that I have in my mind will be using the JMeter. So definitely we will write a endpoint to test the load from that. But since we have about 200 users from that, we don't test. And back to the question of uh, testing the uh, multi-track from that, uh, for both uh, G-Unicorn and the UWSGS turn out to have a very good tools for us. So we can use that to simulate the problems that we have. And this is why I mentioned that in my talk before, we we kept getting this message of uh, uh, MySQL losing queries. And that is a message that we don't understand why. So this is why we thought that it could have been problems for MySQL rather than from the pros, uh, problems of having a G-Unicorn over there. So it turned out to be, you know, uh, global singletons is one of the issues. Is not the issues on the MySQL. Thanks, Jim. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Jim, to joining us uh, uh, to, uh, today. Yeah, we appreciate that. Thank you very much, and yeah. hope you guys enjoy the session. So the uh, next session is uh, put into JS, JS uh, frameworks by like D1. Yeah, so I stop the sharing and then, uh, okay, uh, like you can share your screen. All right, let me share the screen here. Yeah. Does that work? Yes, All right. Good. Yeah, okay. Nice. All right. So, uh, hello. Uh, I'm Nick Doran. I, I was in uh, Hong Kong last uh, almost four years ago. So, uh, ne ho, everybody. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, JAX, which is a machine learning framework. And then people have built other machine learning frameworks on top of it, which is what I'm hoping to introduce you to. So, first, uh, I'm a web developer, like most of you on the chat now. And um, so I'm going to kind of come into it from that perspective. Like if I'm a web developer, what is this? How does it fit into other machine learning libraries I've heard of like PyTorch or TensorFlow? Why are people switching over to JAX? Uh, how do these frameworks make it easier? And then uh, I know it's very difficult to show a lot of code in a talk. So I have a link to some notebooks. So everything I show, there's a notebook that is on my last slide and the slides will be available uh, at some point from PyCon HK. So like I said, I'm a web developer. Um, when we talk about the actual science behind AI and machine learning it can be very intimidating. And I wanna break it down to some smaller parts for you. And obviously this talk won't then won't cover everything. I mean, I'm still learning a lot about this too. Uh, but I hope that if anything in this talk interests you, it will point you in the right direction. Um, so let's start with a sample task. So in machine learning, uh, you might have a problem like this where you have so many thousands of photos of flowers and you want the model to be trained to identify 104 different types. And uh, I, I, I mean, I don't think I could identify 104 different types of flower, um, but this is a task that, you, that they have, uh, it's this one on, on Kaggle. And the basic idea of how you organize this problem is you get the photos, make sure the same, they're the same size and dimensions. Um, they're labeled into which flower type they are. And then you have them divided up. So some of them will be training your model and some of them will be used to test or validate your model because um, it wouldn't make sense to learn from one set and then also ask questions on the same set. Um, and this kind of task is called supervised learning. And because it's images and specific labels, it's called image classification. So I know this is about JAX, but I'm gonna talk about kind of when I get a new problem like this, I like to use a tool called AutoKeras, which is an auto machine learning tool. And you can see kind of a, a little snapshot of my notebook here 
where I've grabbed my data set. Uh, it has the images in 192 pixels by 192 pixels by three RGB channels. So that's like a very similar to a NumPy array. And then I drop it into the Autokeras image classifier and run just fit. Like, so this is doing the least amount of effort. You're gonna need a GPU on your notebook for it to do this, but then it starts training. And when the end, it gets to 84% accurate. So that's pretty good considering there's so many different types. But if I wanna get better than 84%, I need to do two things. One, I need to understand what did this do to be so successful? Like it was random chance it would be less than 1%, right? So what did it do to become successful? And then I need to have some kind of coding tools that allow me to edit that process and make something more custom for my problem. And luckily for us, AutoKeras is based on the Keras framework and you can write a summary. You can ask it for a summary of what its layers are. And so if you look at the output here, you can see in the beginning, it has that 192, 192, three input pixels coming in. It does normalization does random translation or movement of the image on somewhere on the X and Y axes, random flip, which would mirror the image. Um, resizing, it goes through something called ResNet, which I'll explain in a second. And then it is condensed down into the 104 um, labels. So this is a description of a neural network that is a little bit more accessible to see. And let's go, let's go back a second. So when you're talking about image translation and flipping, that's something called data augmentation. So for example, if you were trying to identify people's faces and everyone was looking to the left or the right, um, then it would bias your data in some way. Or if it's a car and every picture of a car is like perfectly centered in your photo, that's gonna bias your model in some way. So, so machine learning researchers have discovered it's good to have this data augmentation step where some of your training data gets moved around or flipped in some way before you even start training. And then ResNet uh, is a common strategy for doing image recognition. And so it's kind of like a big giant block of neural network code that is very common and you can just find in a lot of different machine learning frameworks and drop into your network. It's getting some additional training after that point, but it's a common building block that is familiar to people. And so, like I said, you, to get better results than AutoCaris, you are gonna want to add additional details or additional layers to your network. And that's why there's so many different machine learning frameworks. So uh, probably you're familiar with PyTorch and TensorFlow I mentioned Keras, and then I know there's a Baidu tool called Paddle Paddle, which I haven't used myself, uh, but I know has popularity like on GitHub. And interestingly, each one of these is kind of associated with a different company, right? PyTorch with Facebook, Google and TensorFlow, Baidu and Paddle Paddle. Keras is just kind of complicated because it's also included in TensorFlow. But I'm not. what I'm trying to get at here is that there's not like, something where one of these works and one of them doesn't work. They all are trying to accomplish the same features and same goals. It's more a question of like, which community do you like? Which one is like doing developer outreach in your uh, network that, which has a cool GitHub repo that you want to use. So people tend to pick one or two of these, but there's not like a one, it's not like one of those more accurate and the other one is less accurate. And this brings us to Jax. Jax is kind of interesting. So kind of I've set up this diagram. I don't know if this makes sense to anybody, but hopefully it does. At the top, you have like the auto machine learning tools like auto ML, auto PyTorch, auto Keras that you saw there where you just drop in data. And the bottom are very low level tools like CUDA where you talk directly to GPU hardware and it's messy. And so if you're a web developer, you're, a little, you're obviously a little nervous about, I don't wanna to talk to the GPU. 
uh, directly. Okay. Um, there's like a so the, on the, there's one group that's the TensorFlow family that has TensorFlow and some different tools, and one group that's the PyTorch family, and so they all of these different levels of things. And Jax is actually very low level. It's way down with like NumPy. It's actually very similar to NumPy in terms of what it's designed to do be used for. And you might say, wait a second, we already have NumPy. Why would I want to have another NumPy? Like it's good enough already. Um, so Jax is something that was introduced in um, 2018 and has kind of gained more interest last year and then now this year. And essentially it's designed from the start to be able to run Python functions on a GPU, a TPU, or even multiple GPUs and TPUs. So it is possible for a PyTorch code to be run on Google TPUs and there's different things people have done. But the idea is like, since people are now very interested in running on large clusters, why don't we build something from the beginning that's very good at this? And I'm mostly just running stuff in a Colab notebook. I'm not gonna have a giant cloud network of stuff in my like hobby problems, but I would like to write code that works really well on, you know, that I can interact with someone else who's working on a much larger problem, or I can understand the code that people are doing on a much larger project. Um, so this is, makes me, I think Jax has a really interesting future. So I'd like to use it even in my own projects. And if you look at Twitter, people are very excited about it. You'll see there are new libraries that use it. Uh, researchers say it's very good for prototyping quickly. And, and then because it's very similar to NumPy, a lot of the same functions are in there. And so it's, if you've used NumPy for something, it will seem kind of familiar. This year, one thing that's been a big development is these JAX frameworks. So if you remember way back to when I showed this, JAX is very low level and we'd like to find something that is a little more accessible, a little bit more designed, not just for moving matrices around, but building these custom neural networks. So there's actually tons of them. I wouldn't have time to review all of them, uh, there's one called Flax, which is now releasing a new API called Linen. There's one called Haiku. It's from DeepMind. There's one called Objax. There's one called, called Elegy, which actually is the only one that is not from like a Google or a DeepMind engineer. And it turned out the project that I chose to do the, the Flowers project was somewhat difficult to do. So I did get to that point, but What's the best way to start on this problem? Um, most of these frameworks, they have a ImageNet example. And so ImageNet is a huge data set with, um, I wanna say a thousand different labels. Maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe it's a hundred, I think it's a thousand. Um, and so you classify, they have an example for classifying that. They have an example for MNIST, which is like those uh, handwritten numbers, right? And I found on Colab that ImageNet is much too big. You're not going to be able to do it. So there's a, a data set from ImageNet, like N-E-E, that uh, is like a very tiny ImageNet. There's only um, 10 different classes. It's much more easy for you to get started or to write some code and then quickly change it. Um, so definitely one thing I learned early on in machine learning is the best thing to do is have just to make sure your pipeline is working, don't write a ton of code and then wait for everything to process. Instead, find a very like tiny of just like one or two examples and see if they make it through your pipeline before you start, um, you know, wait waiting for hours for something to run and then dropping in some intermediate step. So let me show you objects. This is the code that they have on the README. So it's not very practical, but gives you an idea of what's going on. So uh, rather than, so you create some different points and then you run them through a linear uh, neural network. 
and then there's this output. And then here they have a convolutional network. So these are some components, different layers you could insert into a neural network. And if you remember way back, you have to remember a little bit back to earlier. So I mentioned that in order to get the image classifier trained, one of the things that Otto Karras selected for us was called ResNet. And so that's like a large neural network component. And so objects includes a, a few of these different components. So they have ResNet here. Uh, they also RNN, BGG, which are good for image classification, image projects. And they also have some additional interesting tools about um, differential privacy, if that's something that you're interested in researching a little more. Um, so definitely they have these and then TensorFlow and PyTorch, these are much more developed. You'll find many more options in those uh, libraries and frameworks, but this is just kind of showing you that there's a lot of things that you can bring into your um, model here, that you can bring into your neural network here um, just with um, the, what exists today in objects. And the example that was shown earlier is just very super simple. What happens in a real neural network is you have a loop where things are training. And every time you make a prediction, you compare it to the expected result. You calculate the difference, which is the loss function. And then the optimizer will change your neural network slightly. So you can do different things to like train different parts of your network at different times or something. But the main thing is you have, you set, you can design these specific components to customize your neural network and how it's trained. Now that you know that, um, here's what my notebook looked like when I was doing the image classification objects. You can see in the beginning, we're importing that ResNet block into here. We give it some different components. Um, then the optimizing step, like you saw here, there's a loss function and optimizing step. The optimizing step, there's a variety of different optimizers that are available from objects. So this is the one, these are, this is very closely based. It's virtually a copy of the ImageNet code in the objects example. So we're using one of their optimizers. If you were interested, you could try different optimizers. You could try different parameters. Uh, there's so many different variables here, but it helps to start with something that you know works because it's in the example. And then when we compute the loss, we have a something, the loss function, which I'll show you later. And objects is helping set up a gradient there. And then for the training step, they have this objects.parallel, which helps you if you were training it on multiple GPUs or TPUs. I, of course, have not. But everything is kind of wrapped in this parallel structure so that things can be trained in that way. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the optimizer, they chose one optimizer called Momentum. And there are a few other optimizers that can be used in that place. The loss function here, uh, like I described, it runs a batch of images through the model. It calculates what is the difference between what was predicted and what the actual values are in that batch. And then it comes up with some numeric value measuring the loss. So that way, the model knows if it's getting closer. Like, is, have you ever played the game hot and getting hotter, getting colder? I don't know, but it's basically telling you, is it getting further away or closer to the optimal settings for your network? And you might say, well, why, why don't I just, you know, just say the difference is the distance in space and that's it. Why do I need a custom loss function? Um, in this case, you don't need one, but if you can imagine an example where it's very critical. For example, if there was a self-driving car and sometimes it doesn't know, you know what is what the speed limit sign specifically says and, this, and sometimes it doesn't recognize a person and crashes right into them, right? 
you'd say that the loss is much more significant if it makes like a very dangerous mistake. You want the loss to just, just say, stay away from this kind of mistake. Uh, another example would be if um, a very issue that's at least very popular and discussed here in the US, if you have, let's say a group of students and only 10% of the students in your training data are part of a minority group, then your model might say, oh good, I can get 90% accuracy by just focusing on the 90% of people that aren't in that group. And the loss function allows you to say, look, don't make mistakes like that. You can't just, you have to measure your loss based on how well is everybody doing in each of these groups. And so that's much more complex. There are different approaches to that. I'm not saying that's the best way to solve this or evaluate your model, but that's why people really get interested in talking about how to measure the loss as they're training their model. And if you, again, remember back to what AutoCaros did, what, they, what it did for us, it did the data augmentation, you know, moving the image around, flipping the image. And here uh, I grabbed some code from another place that put it in. So I have the data set to, here it says random flip left and right. Um, I don't think I have the random translation here. So that might improve it as well. Um, one reason I wanted to show this is that one, we're, we're still doing that data augmentation step, but we're customizing it in some way. We could choose lots of different options. We could change the colors, we could change the lighting. But another thing that's interesting is it uses the TensorFlow tools like tensorflow.image.randomflip. And you'd be like, wait a second, I thought the whole point of using JAX was that we're using a completely different neural network. Why is TensorFlow still in here? But TensorFlow and the T, so first this data set is in the TF record format. So TensorFlow is the best way to open it and divide it into batches and you know randomly shuffle it so it's not biased. And the other thing is it includes all these tools. I'm sure PyTorch is a very similar thing. So I'm not saying it has to be TensorFlow, but at first I was very surprised to see TensorFlow code and JAX code together. But now that I understand that you know it's a Google developed library and TensorFlow already has these tools for working with your data, it makes more sense to me now that we're, they're using the same data entry and data modification tools from TensorFlow. I don't have as much information in the presentation about the other frameworks, but I do have like, links to notebooks. So Haiku is the lightest framework, basically. You'll notice that hk.sequential and linear this is from the README, are um, coming from the Haiku library, but virtually everything else, including calculating the loss function and um, other components of the network come directly from JAX. So it's basically JAX plus some additional neural network friendly functions. Flax and Linen is, a, I'm still trying to fully understand like you saw earlier, it's, it's, it has, um, like with objects, there's different optimizers. There's these different layer types that you can drop in. They have some different examples for ImageNet and other common problems. Uh, I was confused at first, why is the, so Linen is something where they're trying to add a new API that's supposed to be more user friendly. They're trying to, or I can't sp specifically speak for them, but a lot of these frameworks are trying to emulate what people like about like PyTorch or Keras. And so the reason that the new API is called Linen, which I, I didn't know this before, is that the, fla the plant that makes the flax seed, the fabric that comes from that is Linen. Um, so they, they're the same thing as just different uh, APIs for their developers. And they have some, like I said, they have a lot more examples because this is a little more established. Uh, here you can see they, you pass in uh, node X and then you keep applying different layers to it and passing it to the next layer. And then Allergy, I was really excited about this because as I mentioned before, it's, it's not um, from a Google person and they're trying to emulate Keras so if you create the sequential network, you would write it like this, which is very similar to how someone might write it in write a module in Keras. Um, 
unfortunately, I have been trying to run the demo examples in Colab, and I think that they're still working on the API. So I didn't, I wasn't able to have as much success with it. But I think this is one that should be interesting to watch in terms of their developer, where they're coming from, and what they're trying to do for developers. Uh, okay, as I mentioned before, I have uh, notebooks for everyone who's interested and looking into one of these further where I did solve the flower problem that I introduced in the beginning. And it's very similar to the ImageNet though. So I don't wanna take full credit for it, but um, definitely these are based on um, their examples. And I would like to, I plan to continue working in the future on developing these because there's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of new stuff being developed because this is such a new thing. All of the frameworks are new, you know, that you could like come back to the six months later and maybe one of these frameworks is, is you know, isn't running any, is being used anymore. Um, so it's a little risky to get involved in it now, but it looks like researchers really like it as a replacement for kind of the stuff that exists right now in TensorFlow and PyTorch. Um, and it, the people seem really enthusiastic about it, which is always a good thing to have in your um, open source developer world. So yeah, thanks. And um, I don't know how we're doing on time. Oh, we, we're very close to the end. It, let me just run and see if you have any questions then. Thanks. <clears throat> First, like, so I would like, like to ask participants, do you have, uh, if you have any questions, you can time in, uh, in the chat, uh, or you can use, uh, you can also raise your hand and, and just ask directly. Yeah. Yeah, we still have uh, three to five minutes left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd say that uh, one thing that I'm interested in is creating maybe a library that makes some of this a little bit easier. Um, it's not going to be the most accurate library, but it would be something that would make things a little bit easier for people to kind of get started. And then if they want to do something more complicated, then, you know, they would choose one of these frameworks that, you know, they can do the direct settings in. But it just seems like a lot of it is... Um, boilerplate code that seems very similar between projects. So um, I don't know, we'll see what happens with it. I hope they didn't decide who won the election while I was talking to you guys. Yes. Uh, MJ, do you have any questions? Because I saw your mic just, just unmuted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, if you have any question, please, uh, please tell us in half minute. Yeah, and if you're watching this later, you can uh, you can ask me on Twitter. I think it showed at the beginning of the talk, but at mapmeld m a p m e l d. Uh, okay, so I don't see any questions from the audience. So fans like again.
So now we will have a shopping. So we will return uh, at half half past uh, uh, 11. So we will return at 11.30. And one more thing is that uh, we will have uh, two ones of uh, good photos. So we will expect to do the first first one of good photo at the end of uh, the morning sessions and the other one and the second one of the good photo will be taken uh, at, uh, at the end of uh, Cantonese chat but it will be uh, between the uh, Cantonese key, uh, keto sessions and the coaching sessions. So we so we hope that you can join us at the good photo so we can uh, we can have the uh, um, have a more uh, marketing material for that.
Hi, Dalitjanis. Hi, Dalitjanis. May you unmute your mic and do a single sound, sound check with us? Hello? Okay, Can cool. you hear me? Good? Yeah. yeah, we can hear also, you. Also, uh, my video. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm signed right now. <laughs> so we will start in three, uh, three minutes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So big but I bet. Hi everyone. We are we are back again to the another two uh, uh English uh, community sessions. So the next uh, topic is uh, uh mini themes developing embedded graphical user interface using LCDs and microcontroller, right? Um, micro Python users by Diogenes uh, Pascal. Yeah, so you can now share your, your screen. Yeah. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, good, good morning, each and everyone. So let me share my screen first. Uh, okay, hopefully you see my screen. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm again. I'm Johannes Armando Pascal. Let me say. Um, let me share my slide first. Okay. So this is mini frames. We're developing embedded graphical user interface using LCDs and a microcontroller by a micro Python. So who am I? Actually, I'm. I am an electronics engineer based on the Philippines. And technically, I, currently, I'm taking my doctoral studies in one of the universities here. And I love Python for more than three years now. And I've been programming embedded systems. So lately, 
the applications that I have is more on the applications of IoT in the marine realm. So I develop uh, embedded systems, uh, IoT devices, sensor networks that is employed in the sea. So one of these picture here is one of my pirate fish buoy. So pirate fish is one of my projects. So this is an IoT device that will transmit uh, data such as ocean uh, uh, wave height, uh, temperature, and so on and so forth. And I've been using uh, Python, particularly MicroPython, when and I program the embedded systems in this project. So for the outline of my speak, uh, so we're going to discuss what is MicroPython. We're going to discuss what is our embedded systems, particularly GUIs, and a little bit on LCDs then frame buffer and then mini frames, which is the center of my talk. And we will have a demo on these applications. So MicroPython, this is actually a new development created by Damon George, an Australian, that is wherein you can use Python to program uh, microcontrollers. So what is MicroPython? So MicroPython is actually a complete implementation of Python. It is designed to be efficient with resources, and it is compact enough to fit and run within 256 kilobytes of code space. So if you have at least 256K of flash and a 16K of RAM, you can run MicroPython. So the good thing about MicroPython is it excludes a compiler and the familiar REPL, and it supports the basic libraries. But not all libraries in the, uh, in the desktop Python is implemented in MicroPython because of the resource constraint. And the good thing is you can create more modules that control and run the hardware. So why is it so cool? So we can, get, we can use Python in programming embedded systems, microcontroller. And we love the REPL, which is our Python prompt. No? It allows faster iteration and it optimizes developer time. And you worry more about solution and less about implementation. So that's quite cool. So we have a lot of MicroPython applications in general embedded systems, embedded machine vision, embedded machine learning, Internet of Things. And lately, we have the edge computing and artificial intelligence. So the desktop Python can now be employed and enjoyed in the embedded systems. So we can use the different MicroPython IDEs. So I'm using the... Uh, UPyCraft ID, you can actually use PuTTY. And for more professional IDs, you can use this VS Studio Code, PyCharm, and MooEditor. So in our discussion, I will not be using VS Code so that uh, we will not complicate our things. So I'm just using UPyCraft ID in the demo later on. So the main topic today, since I have introduced MicroPython, is mostly now we're going to concentrate on GUIs, or the graphical user interfaces. So in the desktop Python, we have uh, the quite standard GUI frameworks. So examples of this is Kiwi, PyQt, and the plain old TKinter, or the Kinter, WX Python, PyGUI, and PySide. So in the desktop Python, GUIs is fairly, fairly straightforward because of these various uh, frameworks already. Huh? But when we go to embedded graphical user interface, that means for embedded devices, unlike in the desktop, you have limited resources. And here you have to play with an embedded device as well as the hardware LCD. So here, when you develop graphical user interface for these devices, for example, these various LCDs, actually you have to go to the lower levels. You have to know the hardware and you should optimize for low memory and low speed. So LCDs are actually quite notorious for RAM usage. So that's why you have to optimize your code. And here you need to know the electronics. And I, for my case, in my opinion, this is harder than the desktop GUIs. So I will show that later on. So in order to have GUIs in embedded systems, you have to have a certain LCDs. And LCDs are available in the market. This is an example of an LCD wherein LCDs are characterized by, of course, the number of pixels it has, or we call that the resolution. So we have here a 65K color display LCD, no? and the number of inch. So particularly, you have to concentrate on the number of pixels for 80 by 320, and the interface also. 
Now we're going to use the SSD 1306 in my demo in my application. So this is actually a 128 by 64 pixel. It is a monochrome display and it could give you one bit per pixel. So you have to use 1K at least for its buffer memory. And we can have the pixel coordinates in terms of X and Y. So, so in my demo, I'm going to create an LCD object, for example, here, I create a class which is SSD1306 and it, it inherits the frame buffer uh, class. And then we have to specify the width, the height. So our LCD is actually a 128 by 64. So the width must be 128, the height must be 64. Okay. And we have here the initialization routine. So we have to create an I2C object and then we create an LCD object. And from that LCD object, we can now um, create the values routines such as fill, text, and frame write. Okay. Now, a good thing about LCDs when you program is, is you have to know about frame buffers. So frame buffers convert buffer data into XY coordinates into special representation. So if you have a buffer, for example, if you have a 60, uh, 128 by 64 pixel, you should have a buffer in your memory, which is equivalent to 1024 bytes, which is maximum. And you have to convert that into frame buffers. Frame buffers actually convert your buffer into spatial coordinates. So you have to specify the width and the height. And then you call these various frame buffer routines. So if you want to create a line, a horizontal line, fill, rectangle, and so on and so forth. And a central portion is I have developed a library, which is the mini frames. Mini frames actually convert your whole LCD screen into various uh, portions or what we call that widgets. No? So for example, here we have a main frame and the main frame is composed of multiple mini frames. And this is the method we use when we create a, a graphical user interfaces. So for example, these are the routines in the mini frames. So we create an LCD, then we have mini frames and so on and so forth. So let's now go to the demo for this application. So I'm going to demonstrate the use of basic LCD, frame buffers, as well as the mini frames. Okay. So hopefully you can see my screen. So let me magnify this. So in this side, I have an SCD1306 connected to an ESP32. And we have here the UPyCraft IDE. So let me connect to that device first. And let's reboot it. Okay. So let's have a demonstration first of the LCD demo. Okay. So here in the LCD demo, I have to import these various modules. I have a library which is SSD1306. I have to import the frame buffer. And then I create an LCD object with 100 by 64 uh, pixels. And then I fill it with zero and then I have the text and the other routines. So the central object here is we have an LCD uh, object that will call the various routines. And like this, in order for you to call these routines, you have to frame or to write the frames, the buffer to the frames using the LCD, the frame write object. Okay, so to demonstrate that, let me run this. Okay, so you can see, oh, sorry. Okay, so you can see here the LCD writes these lines. No? Okay. Now another demo that I can create is we have the Pirate demo. So here, I now create, I import a mini frames object, and then I have an I2C uh, uh, module. And then if you look at the LCD, I create a display, and then I create a buffer. From that buffer, I put my Parrot logo, and then write that to a frame, to the frame. So basically, we have a Parrot logo which is actually coming from the pirate fish frame pie. 
Okay. So this is the prior space frame. So this is actually a bitmap that is converted into an array. And then I have a pirate logo, which is a memory view, which is actually being used by the pirate fish frame, uh, pirate fish demo. So here, the pirate logo coming from the pirate fish frame is actually uh, being written to the uh, LCD buffer and then being displayed. Okay. So let me go back there. And if you run that, so see, you can see here my pirate fish logo or my pirate fish graphics being uh, displayed. Next, we now have looking at the mini frames. So this is the library that I've created. So in this library, I have two classes, the mini frame class and the display class. So the display is actually a major class that is will be the main frame, representing, representing my main frame. And the mini frames will be the various small frames that compose the whole main frame. Okay. Okay, so. Let me do a quick demo. And from there, we can have a mini frames demo. So here, if you look at my code, so I imported an SSD 13 I2C, uh, SSD library class from SSD I2C. And what's important here is I create an LCD, which is a display object with 128 by 64. And I clear it. And if you look at this portion, we have F1 and F2. So these are my mini frames. Okay. And here in the display, I add these mini frames, F1 and F2. And then from that, I can write the outline of my display. So this time, I have two mini frames having a size of 30 by 16, 50 by 8 pixels. And then from that mini frames, I write text such as hello and PyCon, and then we clear the system and then we refresh it. So for a quick demo, let's run this. So as you can see here, so it's not quite clear. Let me show that to you closer. Okay. So basically we have F1 which is this one, and F2, which is this one. Okay. And then I create the hello, this one, and then the PyCon HK on this portion. So it's not quite clear, but uh, because of the resolution of the camera. Okay. And of course, since you can run that, you can make a call. So for example, LCD. So LCD is a display buffer. Okay, and the various objects that are in the LCD, we can have the mini frames, the clear mini frames, and the movement of and so on and so forth. So these are the various uh, methods and classes inside that LCD. So if I say LCD clear, so if you notice this, my LCD is now clear. And if I can do LCD that refresh, So I put the LCD again. Now, if we look at the various uh, mini frames that we have, I can say LCD dot mini frames. So this is actually a list of all the mini frames that this display has. So it has a mini frame object at 0, 0 and a mini frame object at 0, 0. So these are the locations, 0, 0 and 0, 0 to the locations of the mini frames. And if I look at my LCD dot mini frames names, see that. so I have F1 and F2. Okay. So these are the various methods in the mini frames. No? So if I do uh, this uh, LCD dot clear, so it will clear the LCD. But then the mini frames are still there. And if I do a LCD dot refresh, now the mini frames will be done. So 
the good thing is you can think of mini frames as widgets and then you can populate your own systems with that sorry mini frames okay So, in a recap, these are the various methods for the mini frames. So, again, thank you. Um, if for more information, you can go to these various sites, okay? For and you can reach me in my email, which is jobpasqua@gmail.com. So, if you have any questions, then I'm open for questions. Thanks. Thanks, the old Jews, okay. Genies. Um, I would like to ask the participants, do you have uh, any questions? Please uh, type your questions on the chat or raise your hand so you can, so you can unmute your mic to ask your questions. Uh, James, uh, would you mind to unmute your mic to ask questions? Okay, uh, I got a question over here. So it's tied up that. What hurdles do you have in writing the data into the LCD buffers? So meaning that in this case, uh, do you need, like, I mean, as an extension of a question, do you need to create a buffer in the ESP32 memory to deal with the buffer? Because when I look at your buffer on the screen, it's like, just about 1k so i wonder how you deal with this kind of a situation okay so uh thank you for the question james uh, yeah i think the greatest challenge when we do lcd uh applications in MicroPython is the buffer you say every lcd has a will require a buffer and in order for that to work also to control lcd you have to replicate a buffer in the esp32 and the esp32 is quite limited in ram so, so for our small LCD SSD 1306, we have a 128 by 64, and that is one bit per pixel. So that will translate to 1024 bits, so which is 1K RAM. So when I created the RAM in the microcontroller, there's no issue in memory because that's still quite small. No? But for other LCDs, that's especially with higher resolutions, wherein you can have around 16K or 200K. For example, we have 1024 by 64 pixel, and then each pixel is 24 bits. So that's a very large RAM. And that will now be a challenge in microcontrollers. So what I did is I use a file system for this, and then from that file, I just get a small chunk of the, the buffer or the array and put it in the LCDs. So the challenge is really actually on the buffers. But for the SSD 36, that is 1K. So that still is manageable in the ESP32 RAM. Thank you. So, uh, so any other questions from the audience? So you, you can raise your hand. So we can have a more interactive between the speaker and audience. So I will wait for I will wait for one more minute to see any questions from audience.
<laughs> okay, so 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 yes, no more questions from the audience. So uh thanks again, uh thanks uh, uh Diogenes to uh to 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 tell us about the MicroPython. Yeah. Okay, thank you also for the opportunity that you've given me. So it's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so see you everyone. Thanks. So the next session will be start from uh, 12, 12, uh, 12 p.m. And uh, so we have uh, about uh, uh, eight minutes left. Let me double check about the starting time. Uh, so we about that. Uh, the next session will be start from uh, twelve uh, ten. Yeah. So um, so we can have a longer break uh, from before the uh, next session. So we will uh, start from uh, twelve ten according to our schedule.
Hi, Chris. Can you do a sound check? Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Friends. Yeah, talk to you in a few minutes.
uh, we will start the next session in three minutes. In, in three minutes. Okay, let's start the uh, last session uh, of the English community chat uh, this morning. So this, uh, this session is uh, building West API endpoint with uh, Fast API by uh, Chris Choi. Yeah, so Chris, you can share your screen. And now everyone see my uh, screen. Yeah. Great. Uh, so it's uh, 12 p.m. Good afternoon. So so we're talking about building West API with uh, Fast API. Uh, all the code will be available uh, on my GitHub, github.com, Chris TLC, PyCon, HK, 2020 Fast API. The slides and all the code will be uh, available. Um, today's content, we're going to uh, very quickly introduce what is a fast API, what is a West API. Uh, we'll do a quick demo what is uh, really good about uh, using fast API to build a uh, West API. Uh, at the end of it, I will give a few tips and uh, comparison, for example, with fast. If you have used fast to build a West API previously. Um, so let's get the basic terms of what is precisely a REST API. So this is like a typical architecture I have built for multiple applications where we have a database. Then there's, we have a REST API that literally talks to the database and talk to the web application. The web application or other application would show the result via this uh, REST API. And uh, REST API especially allows very simple uh, authentication to be built as well. So uh, we would walk through some of the examples today. What I really like about the Fast API when compared to some of the other existing libraries in Python, there are multiple uh, advantages. Number one of them is the parameter validation is really, really helpful. Uh, we can kind of use some combination of other libraries, for example, in Fast to do it, but this built in the Fast API. Uh, the API documentation is really, really neat as well. Uh, we'll show a demo of this. 
and uh, the multiple files, we want to split the script into multiple files, it's built and in fast, you have to kind of use another library as well. So some batteries included and usually these are the typical stuff you always need. So uh, this is something quite nice about fast API. Let's uh, get started with some really simple uh, example. So right now I have this, let's see whether I can be. This is a bit annoying. The uh, bar is precisely at the place where I'm supposed to have the file names. Okay. Just give me one second. Is there a way I can hide this? Yep. Everyone can still see my screen, right? Okay. Um, so how we are doing this uh, fast API is very simple. Just in a few lines, we'll be able to build a very simple Hello World example. So we first import the fast API, create an app using the constructor, then create an endpoint that is the get endpoint at the root that returns a Hello World as a JSON. Then we can run this uh, with this main function here. So we, let's run it. So we create a endpoint under this uh, HTTP address. back. So we just return the hello world. What really, really nice about fast API is that this also comes with uh, docs automatically. So it comes with a nice documentation interface where we can easily try the uh, endpoint ourselves. This would come in very handy, for example, when we are developing uh, the application or trying to hand off this API with some other front end developer. So let's go back to the slide. Okay, so after the hello example, let's do something slightly more elaborate. So for example, we would like to do like a messaging uh, endpoint where we have free endpoint. So we have a get message, we will return all messages uh, in the dictionary. Then we have a post message endpoint with we write message to a specific ID. Then we can also build a get endpoint that return the message of a particular ID. Let's uh, see this in action. So what is this is really simple. So well, the, uh, this is still the original Hello World that gives us Hello World. Then we have a multiple other endpoints that for example, this one will list all messages. Right now there's no messages. Let's uh, create one message on using this post method. Icon is great, let's try this. It works. So uh, if we get the messages again, we should be able to see the response uh, body. Let's dive uh, into the code and see how precisely I uh, will build this. So previously you have the hello world. So from this line onwards are the code that we have just uh, described. So we have a get endpoint for the messages, which we just return the uh, local dictionary, which will serve as the uh, local store of all the messages. Then we have a get endpoint that would take in the messages and a specific item ID in integer. And we will return this particular ID in integer and get the local dictionary item back. There's also an endpoint that allow us to uh, persist a particular message. 
in a post format. So the post is collected uh, in two different parameters. So one is this path parameters, it collects the parameters through this item ID as part of the path. Then part of the messages is uh, collected through uh, Kiwi messages. So uh, we can see this uh, in action here, actually. Let's do a pose again. So what it actually does is that the item ID is passed as the part of the path and the message is passed part of the uh, Kiwi messages after the question mark. So what is really, really neat about Fast API is it allows you to create all these uh, Kiwi parameters and mapping automatically. So I can give you a one example where this is uh, neat as well. There's like an automatic, uh, let's try the message. Get message ID. So this would just return the uh, first magic pike on this great, right? So if we paste this particular request URL, this would work. What really, really nice about this is, uh, for example, if we type in something that is not what it is intended, it gives really, really meaningful uh, resource, uh, re meaningful uh, debug messages. It tells you the item ID, the value, the value is not a valid integer. Uh, if you have used the vanilla fast, this uh, function is not built in. So there are some other libraries you can use on top, but uh, what I find fast API really, really needs is that this uh, battery is already included and it's uh, implemented uh, really, really screen as well. So you can also see on the documentation, it precisely require you to type in uh, integer. So you can't even type in, if you type in anything not an integer, it will also warn you that this is not a valid, uh, it's not a valid KV. That's a really, really neat of uh, fast API. It is just, uh, this is how we implemented this. Uh, you can see that we can implement something fairly complex in a really, really few number of lines with documentations and uh, all the QV being done uh, and validated correctly. I've also shown you an example where, for example, this uh, message is when we didn't put in the correct type, it would be able to uh, give you very meaningful messages where why this is not working and a validation that, okay, this is not correct. Uh, testing is also very simple to do. Uh, if you do uh, like test driven development, I can show you an example here. So for example, we have this test fast API. A really simple test is just to call the test client and import the uh, app function from the previous uh, main that we have uh, shown you. So literally the fast API app. Let's go to the test. And the client works actually, this is like a request object uh, from the request library. Uh, if you're familiar with a request library, you can, you can uh, feel comfortable in testing it. And once we have this result, we can test the JSON, we can test the uh, status code and make sure the uh, result has exactly what we expected. So we can also test, for example, other methods of uh, posting messages, whether it's working correctly. Uh, all of this can also be done in relatively few lines. Uh, I really like this when compared to uh, some other API uh, libraries. So far, we have talked about two different type of parameters. We can get it through uh, the Kiwi string and, and as part of the path, that's another uh, 
type of parameter where we call a body parameter, which would uh, exist if you do a pose or like a, a pose request. To define a body parameter, we have to define a schema. A schema is a, a pandemic, literally a pandemic uh, model that describes what's inside. So for example, if we would like to uh, go back to the main again, Instead of a string messages, we like to accept any uh, and other message format in terms of body. We can uh, do this. And the message actually we, uh, consists of two, two uh, fields. Number one is a message that is a string and a matter that is uh, an optional dictionary. Let's go back to the test interface uh, to see it in action. So let's type it free. Oh, body is more flexible. So if we embed the uh, parameter in the body is even more flexible. We can literally put in anything uh, we would like. So this could just be any dictionary. Any key, any content. This should just work. And let's list out all the messages we have so far in the message endpoint. So in the MSA chain point, we are going to list out all the possible messages. So you can see that right now, the uh, new messages is also persisted to uh, key number three. So it's possible to pass it like a variety of things across to the uh, fast API endpoint through the body messages. Another feature that is really, really neat is to add authentication to your existing endpoint. Uh, let me just give you one example here. Let's stop the previous process and look at this main two. To create an Authenticated endpoint, there are a couple of things we have to add. We have to import some libraries from the fast API security packages. This we just do a very simple uh, password based uh, OAuth2 scheme. We also have to create a new token, uh, token endpoint, which would provide uh, the user with a token. when they lock in. So this is the lock-in uh, endpoint. And for a particular endpoint that needs protecting, we have to literally depends on the O of uh, two scheme. So right now this route, the Hello World uh, endpoint is protected with this scheme. Let's see this uh, in action. What's really, really neat about this test, uh, test interface is that it integrates directly with the authentication uh, interface. So username is root, password is password. I think this should work. Close. You can see that with this uh, lock-in, you said this lock is already locked. We should be able to query it uh, correctly with Hello World. If we lock out and try this again, yeah, we should return to you as a not authenticated uh, result. So what you typically do is that you return a JWT type of token. This is just an example. 
uh, where you return the token uh, when the username is root and the password is password that you should replace with hash password anyway. But this is just an example. And uh, the token should be a JWT token. Once you integrate this type of, you can kind of see that it's really easy to roll your own uh, authentication or integrate with some third party uh, services through this. But, uh, this is just to give you an example how this would work. Just in a few lines, we have authentication built in that also works with the uh, test interface. This is like uh, one of the best thing we have seen. Uh, it's really difficult to do this properly otherwise. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what are the uh, key benefits of uh, Vanilla Fast. Uh, one of the best thing, of course, uh, Vanilla Fast comes with no battery included. So this is uh, good news that it has some power meter validations, the automatic documentation generations the interface I've just shown you is always there. This is also really nice. Uh -huh. Also the multi-file router is there. So if you use Fast, all of these single functions we have to create uh, we have to use some extra libraries, uh, which tends to be really, really uh, time consuming and quite difficult to maintain as well. So uh, it's in terms of number of lines of code is a lot less. Uh, there are also a couple of uh, tips and tricks I can share with you in using this uh, fast API. Uh, number one tricks I can share with you, uh, which is usually really, really annoying and can share with you this particular example. Let's look at this JSON example. So there are two endpoints. So one of them is just to X return this very generic output, which contains a none and an NAN. What is really annoying about the default, uh, default JSON packages that comes with the standard library of Python is that this is actually not a compliant JSON uh, out output. I'll show you in a bit. The alternative is not to use the uh, default JSON uh, serialization, is to use what they call another library. This has a much better uh, serialization defaults, literally this compliant JSON when they spread it out. So I can show you, this is one of the tricks I've been using. Let me share with you this example. Slash docs. The version one with the default JSON serialization would not work. Actually, it will return the 500 error. If we go back to this uh, interface to check, it will say that the out of range for value are not JSON compliant. And if we look at what's actually inside, you can see that the uh, none is translated correctly as uh, now, which is valid JSON. And the NAN from NumPy packages is translated to NAN. So, but there's no NAN in, uh, in the standard JSON. So if you pass this payload to the front end, they will not be able to recognize it. Uh, one of the easiest tracks I can share with you is that to use this uh, OR JSON response, uh, this is actually generating the expected result. Both of the results which generate uh, now as expected. So this is one of the tracks I can share with you uh, when deploying this uh, endpoint. Okay. Uh, one benefit, of course, in using fast API because it's built one ground up uh, using async. Uh, but what I have actually tried to benchmark previously is that, for example, using this very simple example, uh, the, there's not much benefits uh, in, in most of our standard use case, like reading from the database, getting back very quickly. So the only sensible use case is that you have some really, really long running queries that uh, will hold the connection for a long time. Otherwise, the benefit is actually not much, not as much as I expected as well. I did that with some really, really quick uh, benchmark. Uh, 
the other benefits, of course, in using fast API is the uh, documentation is really, really nice. Uh, for example, it shows you just as I shown you how to use this OLJ on response instead, and they have uh, all the information you need to, for example, to uh, query the SQL databases, uh, how to handle files, uh, all the uh, examples are really detailed and has all the standard uh, information you need to make sure it's working correctly. So this is really, really nice about this uh, API as well, this uh, library. Uh, any questions so far? Anyone has any questions so far? Uh, Thanks, Chris. I would like to ask uh, our audience, if you have any questions, please uh, type in the chat or, or, or you can uh, raise your hand and then we would like you to unmute your mic to ask the questions. Yeah, just, uh, just in case no one is asking questions, we are also hiring uh, multiple position at data analysts and interns. If anyone is interested, that will be uh, really welcome. Any, any questions? Uh, Sammy, do we still have more time? How, uh, when, uh, when is it the end of sections? Mm. Let me check. Uh, I think we still have uh, six minutes left. Okay, I can share with you uh, some more example uh, while we have time. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, uh, one of the uh, Nice thing I really like about Python and why I developed quite a few endpoints with Python is the integration with this um, data, data related libraries. So for example, we have pandas, right? Pandas is one of the library that manipulate all this data. So we can easily create endpoints with some CSV data, for example, I just very quickly uh, did this uh, this morning. Let me stop this. Uh, This is a very simple endpoint where I read all the data from all these baby name databases and see which names are more the most uh, popular. So this uh, year endpoint is literally returning all the information about this uh, particular year, returned as a JSON file, JSON file. Can be done in simply just like one line here. So we can read the data as a pandas data frame. We can just output it using this to deck function. To dictionary function, you'll be able to literally transform it from a data frame to a dictionary. We can also, for example, uh, look at for a particular year, which one, which names is more, uh, most popular for, uh, for that particular year. So let's see. What are the names that are most popular for that particular year? So it gives you a list of uh, all the names with the highest uh, percentage. So Jacob is a really popular name in uh, year 2000. So it's very easy to do data related endpoint using a combination of pandas and all this data manipulation library. Uh, just one line and largest percent, then you can get the 10 largest. Uh... Most popular baby name of that year. You can also easily export it to uh, multiple different formats. So right now it's OV and equals to records. So if you look at the pandas documentation, you can also, for example, uh,
to organize it in a slightly different format. So this is like uh, based on the index and the year would organize as like one single dictionary. So there are multiple ways to organize it. But what I found is most useful again, as a tip is that uh, if you have orient equals to records, it's usually slightly more user-friendly where the records are organized uh, in their own dictionary. So it's a list of dictionary. So this is uh, another quick sharing I can uh, provide to everyone. So if any extra questions we have. So today, uh, all code will be available on GitHub. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, thanks, Chris. So any questions from the audience? So we will wait for a half minute. Um, after these sessions, we will have a quick uh, wrap up and also uh, and also go photo as well. So please prepare to uh, to start your video. <laughs> so we can have a good photo on time and and quickly. Yeah. So it seems uh, I don't see any uh, questions from the audience. So thanks, Chris, again for the, for the presentation about the uh, fast API. So I'll change to my uh, slide first. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. <clears throat> OK. So thanks for everyone to attend uh, the um, uh, morning uh, in, uh, English uh, community sessions uh, of the PyCon Hong Kong uh, Fair uh, 2020. Um, um, uh, so, so you can share your your feeling, your opinions, your and. Uh, or any share about the PyCon Hong Kong with the hashtag uh, PyCon HK and PyCon HK 2020 on your social network or blog post, something like that. So we can have to uh, promote the uh, PyCon together. And also thanks for our sponsor, uh, Code for Health, um, uh, Microsoft, um, MySQL, and thanks for our system uh, speaker uh, yesterday and today. Also thanks for our volunteers. So thanks uh, Daisy to help us to do the social networking and, and care for the uh, design and Hagen and Pao for the finance and, and Fiona and Andy on marketing and, and the mark and the afternoon sessions will be hosted by Mark. Um, uh, and thanks for our proposals, wedding committee, uh, 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 Gay Finn Chen, uh, Scotty God, and Yang and Kim. And thanks for uh, our video operations, uh, Harry Law and Ken Chiu. And um, uh, yeah, please uh, fill the uh, feedback form after uh, this conference. So you can scan the uh, QR code um, or, or use the uh, URL bit.ly PyCon HK20 feedback. Um, and, and you can, if you are interested to, to, uh, to purchase, ad, purchase additional t-shirt, so you can uh, email to PyCon at PyCon HK or uh, or, 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 or contact me, yeah. So uh, 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 this afternoon we will have, we will start the uh, Cantonese uh, community chat, starting from uh, uh, Winnie for the uh, uh, data pi with a uh, Tencent phone model using uh, Pi Spark. And uh, COVID-19 chatbot with Python 
from uh, Microsoft uh, MVP and uh, Apache uh, Heron uh, about the um, cybersecurity with Py Python. And Hoa will uh, share with us uh, how to build an uh, interactive map portal with the Geo Django. And, and the last session is the keto session of the uh, Cantonese uh, community chat, which uh, talk about the uh, how the uh, speaker uh, 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 learn Python and machine learning to to do the uh, uh, side uh, language regulations uh, translator. So it's a very interesting pro pro project, and the project is still is still uh, ongoing. So uh, this is our recommendations um, of uh, this afternoon. So uh, the closing sessions, I will uh, I will do a quick uh, presentations about the Python Hong Kong and the uh, local Python community as well. So that is so. We will have um, have a uh, uh, good photos. Okay, please turn on your, your your video, your webcam. So we will uh, take the uh, good photo uh, uh, in half minute. So I have another angle. Okay. So uh, we are we are we are we will wait for additional. We will wait for uh, ten more minutes. Uh, ten more seconds to take the um. Okay, ready? Okay, I will say three, two, one, cheese, and then I will take a couple of uh, skin cap. Yeah. Okay, three, two, one, cheese. Okay, thanks for everyone. Okay. We will see you again uh, this afternoon. So uh, we will start from uh, uh, two uh, two two thirteen. Two thirty. Two two thirty. And the uh, sooning will be uh, we will start the sooning about uh, two fifteen. Yeah. Oops. Yes. Enjoy your lunch and see you uh, this afternoon. Bye-bye.